All of the episodes of this season's podcasts are made possible by a generous grant from the Charles E. Kubley Foundation. We are solely responsible for podcast content. Hello, and thank you for joining us on Giving Voice to Depression. I'm Bridget. And I'm Terry. More than 350 million people worldwide suffer from depression, but you do not have to have it yourself to be affected by it. Its prevalence pretty much guarantees that someone you care about battles its darkness. This podcast tries to shine some light into that darkness. We're not experts, and we're not therapists. We're sisters and best friends who live with depression and are committed to encouraging healthy, healing conversations about mental illness. Hi, Bridget. Hi, Terry. This has been a hard week, and there has been an awful lot of attention focused on mental health because of the high-profile suicides of both fashion designer Kate Spade and celebrity chef Anthony Bourdain. Yes. And it's important to keep in mind that every day families and communities are devastated by suicide. Mm -hmm. And according to a report that was released this week by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the suicide rate in the United States is on the rise in almost every state in our country. Mm -hmm. Over half of those states are seeing a 30 percent plus increase, Terry, and that's over the last two decades. Yeah. Our last two episodes focused on how to reach out for help and support. And today's episode acknowledges that not everybody has a support network or feels comfortable calling on it. And that's where suicide hotlines and crisis hotlines come in. That's right. Dr. John Draper, director of the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, is widely considered one of the leading experts in crisis intervention and hotline practices. And we're lucky enough to speak with him today. And we asked him to explain the lifeline process and how it can help callers get through a crisis, which it does. Mm -hmm. The number, which we'll repeat several times, end post is 1-800-273-TALK or 1-800-273-8255. Here is Dr. John Draper giving his voice to depression. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is a network of about 160 crisis call centers across the U.S. Its trained listeners answered more than 2 million calls in 2017 alone. That's a number we didn't expect to reach until 2019. Right now, calls are about 60% higher than they were the same time last year. And while some might hear that number and think it's alarming or sad, from Dr. Draper's perspective, it's a great start. There's over 12 million people with serious suicidal thoughts, so we're only reaching 2 million, and about uh, 25% of our callers are suicidal, and that's about 500,000 a year. So we're, we have many more to go. to to be able to reach all of the people we feel like we need to reach. Now, beyond defining the scope of the need, Draper said something else really helpful and important in that answer that we want to call attention to. 25% of callers to the lifeline are suicidal. That means three of every four are not. We want to point that out because we don't want anyone waiting until they're closer to the edge to think they somehow qualify to dial the hotline. Call any time you or someone you're worried about is in distress. We Years ago, we had evaluators, uh, independent evaluators, evaluate not just um, suicidal callers to see if the work we were doing was effective, but also non-suicidal crisis callers um, and found that, that uh, the service was effective both in reducing suicidal and emotional distress in suicidal callers and suicidality and emotional distress, and also found that we were effective in reducing uh, uh, all sorts of emotional distress for non-suicidal crisis callers. So it's in some ways a mental health service that's being provided free of charge for many people who are in some way, we know that many people are not going to get care, and so if this is the only care they're going to get, it's nice to know that it does actually reduce distress. It's reassuring and kind of amazing, actually, to think that you can be someplace really dark and scary, seemingly out of options, and a free phone call to a total stranger 
can literally change something in you. Talking with somebody is rarely going to solve the problem that's causing you distress. But the biggest thing that is that is really uh, preventing you from coping with the problem is the distress. Typically, uh, the the prefrontal cortex goes offline, and really the kind of primitive aspects of the brain that connect to fight, flight, and freeze are activated. And, and when they're activated, our job is to, re- is to help the individual feel safe. And, and typically em- empathic connections, um, where a person feels understood, they begin to feel less threatened, less scared, less anxious. And when that happens, you can actually begin to engage a more thinking individual. So, so the prefrontal cortex will come back online. That's as sciencey as we're going to get. But think about it. A person in crisis who feels heard, understood, and supported can shift. We don't need magic wands and cures. We need caring connections and hope. And the Lifeline offers those 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. While certainly a lot of problems may seem insurmountable, what we know is when a person feels like they're not doing it alone, they feel like they can perhaps get through it another day and then another day after that and before you know it, they're feeling a lot better. In fact, what we found with the research on the lifeline is that not only does a caller feel better by the end of the call, but when they followed up with the caller three weeks later, they felt better still. Um, and I think that's just a function of the crisis state, that, that when you are really in that dark place and you feel like there's no way out, there's also nowhere else to go but up. And so when you begin to open a few lights in that darkness, um, the light spreads over time as you begin to, to come out of crisis. So uh, that's just, I think, the nature of crisis states and why it's important to have somebody connect with somebody in that moment. In addition to offering non-judgmental support and empathy, listeners also assess the nature and severity of the crisis and the level of risk. So if you ever call, expect some questions and know that it is safe and important to answer them honestly. If you're phoning a suicide hotline, then we're certainly going to ask you if you're suicidal and, and if so, if you have a plan or or um, you know a method or something like that, and and then we'll we'll help to calm you and connect you. Um, most importantly, we want to listen, um, and as we kind of listen and and then begin to collaboratively problem solve with you. That is, um, we we listen to find out what your what are the things that are that have helped you in the past. Who in your life might be helpful now? What sort of activities or tools you might have available that that can help reduce your distress when you get off the call? Or others, again, you can contact if you're seeing a therapist, talking about, you know, again, reconnecting with your therapist um, or referring you to resources certainly are things that we, we do commonly. While depression is ever eager to convince you that no one understands or cares what you're going through, that you're utterly alone and nothing but a burden to others, the person on the other end of the hotline call knows that none of that is true. The counselors have talked to a lot of people near, on, or across the line, and they won't judge you for being there, too. Most of the time when people are at the highest risk when they call us, the very highest risk, about 76% of the time, we're able to de-escalate them collaboratively. Um, so again, I think it's because most people who call us do so because they want help. And, and we're accustomed to dealing with people who are suicidal, so we don't freak out when we talk with people who are thinking about suicide. That's natural and common on our line, so uh, we're trained to help de-escalate that. So tuck that knowledge away. There's not much you can say that will shock a crisis line worker. It's a no-shame zone. And the odds are very much in your favor that reaching out will truly help you 
or whoever you're calling for. Suicidal thoughts are often a way of, of dealing with emotional pain that feels unimaginable and, and overwhelming. Um, but it doesn't last forever. That's a fact, not a platitude. It's also why reaching out to your own personal support network or a hotline is so important because the vast majority of people thinking about suicide get past the crisis alive. It's true. It's, you know, for every person that dies by suicide, there's another to about 280 people who think seriously about it but don't. And most of those people don't because they, they find ways to get through that moment. Some feel suicidal later, but many, many people get help and get through that moment. Before we knew better, when our understanding of suicide and suicidal thoughts was the little we picked up on hushed sidelines, we assumed that a person saved from suicide would be, well, pissed. They decided their life was unlivable, we thought, and now, thanks to some do-gooder, they were stuck with it. But that is not the way it is. Every single attempt survivor we've spoken with, and there have been many, have said they're glad to be alive, that their past selves would not even recognize their current selves, and that the work they do or the family they have or whatever would not even exist if they had died. Even people who have literally jumped from bridges and survived have told us they had instant regret and on the way down realized they wanted to live. Honestly, so think about that if things are bad, and trust us and a whole lot of people who have been there. It is worth fighting through the suicidal crisis. Your life can and will be better than depression has you believing. Most of the people that think about suicide get through it, and it's our job, I think, as a suicide prevention community to tell those stories so your listeners know what is the pathway back to hope. How, how do people get through it? And I think we need to have more stories, models, to let people know how and how often hope, healing, and help uh, are happening. After nearly 25 years in the field, Draper has learned that crisis can be something to not just get through, but to learn from. That's another way to think about it. It's an existential crisis that says that has is the, this kind of major question, why am I living? Why, why should I go on? And in some ways, answering that question in one way or another is on the other side of, of recovery. And so what people often learn, um, and many that I've spoken to, is that it's not so much that uh, my life that needs to end, but perhaps the way I've been living my life needs to end. Uh, I mean, I can't tell you how many people who I've talked to, have got, talked to have gotten through a suicidal crisis who just say, um, you know, years later, they say, my God, I cannot believe I would have missed so many things. Mm. Wow. Yeah. So I think there's lots of ways to get through a dark moment. But the fact that this one is available 24-7 and is free and alleviates all the angst and anxiety around burdening a family or friend mm -hmm. is a wonderful option. Absolutely. And I just want to repeat that, the hotline number one Absolutely. more time. It's something I believe we should all program into our phones, if not for ourselves. We never know what circumstances we're going to find ourselves in. And it's 1-800-273-8255. And when you mention that, we have often said that, you know, if you are in a situation, you want to help somebody, but you don't feel confident or comfortable or able to help yourself, you can you can dial this number on your speakerphone and talk, you know, with the trained listener and with the person who's in crisis. There's also a text line. I know a lot of people prefer text, and that in the U.S. is 741741. We got to also, and, and this is very much in light of um, the deaths and, and all the dialogue resulting from them this week, uh, we really got to be there for each other before a suicidal crisis state is reached. And we asked Dr. Draper about that as well, uh, how we can be there for each other. And there are a lot of different programs out there, but his five-step approach. Ask, keep them safe, be there. 
help them connect, and follow up? The first two steps um, are really just asking directly about suicide and then removing access to lethal means. So if, if they say that they're thinking about suicide uh, and you ask them how, and they say, I, you know, I'm thinking about pill, taking these pills or, 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 or shooting myself, then you, know, you would ask to ask them if I could hold on to those pills for you while you're going through this rough time, or could I hold on to your ammunition for you? Things that would just so while you're feeling scared right now and, and you're going through this tough time, I, I can hold on to this stuff for you. And again, doctors can't do that. They, they can't go to the person's home typically and take their pills from them or, 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 or remove the ammunition from their guns. That's something that, you know, loved ones can do. The third step is be there. Listen, there's no therapist that can say to a person who's suicidal, I love you and you're not going to have to go through this alone. Um, uh, that's not, no one can say that like somebody who is truly in the individual's life. Um, and, and that, those are the, that's probably the most powerful suicide prevention tool is feeling like you're valued and connected to somebody in a meaningful way. Isn't that interesting? The most powerful suicide prevention tool is feeling valued and connected. One of the women on our Facebook page this week mentioned that she um, invited somebody to sleep over at her house who mm -hmm. was in crisis. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a great one. Mm -hmm. And then the last two of the crisis outreaches that Dr. Draper recommends. The fourth step is getting others to to join us you know so it's not just between you and me what other support persons in your life can we bring into this um including a therapist including the hotline but but perhaps coach clergy friends lovers family um and then the last thing is following up with people afterwards talking with them you know letting them know hey i'm gonna call you back and you know tomorrow or three days from now, just to see how you're doing. Those are all things that we know make a difference in, in preventing suicide. So those are things we can all learn and all do. Just like we've made an effort to learn CPR or the Heimlich maneuver or other ways to save a life in an emergency. And that's what a suicidal crisis is. It's a medical emergency and that exactly. it is treated so differently is, is odd and, um, and, and ineffective. So it's time to get involved pastime. Oh, Terry, my heart is so heavy right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to say about that, Bridget, because there's a part of me that like hates that all the attention is only on when it's a, a, a celebrity, exactly. but I'm also grateful exactly. for the, the, the stimulation of the happening. conversation. Yeah, but it, it, it almost implies that it's more important because it affects more people. Yes. It's a hard one. Yes. And like today, how many mothers are dealing with this and how many family members are dealing with it? Right. And it has to feel like less important or something. It just, I don't know, my heart's so heavy. We'll post a link of the five steps. And again, please put this phone number in your cell phone because we never know when we're going to need it. It's 1-800-273-TALK or 1-800-273-8255. And we'll post the additional numbers for our listeners outside of the USA on our Facebook page and our website. So thank you for listening. Tune in to this podcast and tune in to each other, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's a, a family member, a friend, a, a, somebody you see. They don't have to be over the rail on a bridge for you to recognize that maybe they're, they're in distress and to just say, do you want to talk? I'm here. I will listen to you. You're not alone. And that can make a, a really big difference. And we urge you to Absolutely. take that step. Absolutely. Take care of yourselves and take care of each other. We hope that these shared stories bring out a little more understanding or help people articulate their experiences of depression a little more clearly or more freely. Thanks to all, everyone who's digging deep and finding the words and finding the courage to give voice to depression. You can find all the other episodes, some resources, and a blog on our website, givingvoicetodepression.com. And you can find the podcast most of the other places that you find podcasts. Just Google it, as our mom says. <laughs> <laughs> and please remember, if you're hurting, speak up. If someone else is hurting, listen up.